Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this virtual event. I am Ellen Hannock. I'm the director of the Water Policy Center at the Public Policy Institute of California. Um, I am uh, starting to get experienced in, in watching virtual events, but um, bear with me and give me a little indulgence, please, because it's the first time I'm on the um, speaking end of one of these. So uh, welcome to my dining room and uh, hope you all are doing well. Um, for those of you who don't know PBIC and for whom it's the first time joining one of our events, we are a nonpartisan policy-oriented research institute that provides essential objective information to help shape a better future for our state. And the Water Policy Center at PPIC focuses on doing this to help Californians tackle the really tough water management challenges that we face at a state. This is an essential resource for so much of you know, everything <laughs> that we do in, in California. And um, so it's a, it's a very rewarding um, task and, and, and job. Um, and what we have been focusing on, among other things, over the last few years is a really um, deep dive into looking at how the San Joaquin Valley is going to be able to take on some of its very tough water management challenges. This is California's largest farming region. It is uh, a place where agriculture is a really important part of the economy as well. And it is the, also the region with the largest overdraft of groundwater. Um, that's been something that's been going on for many decades and really accelerated during the, the latest drought from 2012 to 2016. That was among the reasons why California was uh, able to enact the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in 2014 at the height of the drought, what were really a lot of problems that were cropping up in the valley in, in additional ways like dry wells, uh, land sinking or subsiding, and just a, a general concern that um, the resource was not gonna continue to be there if it wasn't managed in a, in a more sustainable way. So the Sustainable Manage Groundwater Management Act, affectionately known as SIGMA, um, got enacted in, in September of 2014, and it applies to basins, a couple hundred um, basins around California. The Valley, San Joaquin Valley is really ground zero for implementation of SIGMA because it's got some of the basins that have been designated as critically overdrafted. And those basins had to get their groundwater sustainability plans ready and submitted to the state in January of this year. So we've done you know, quite a, a bit of work in the past on looking at what SIGMA means for the Valley and looking at solutions that can be as helpful as possible to getting to say sustainability in a way that's protective of the environment and society and, and the economy, the regional economy of, of the region. Um, but what we now had the opportunity to do once these plans were submitted uh, was to take a look at them and see kind of basically a first stock on, on how these plans, which are really the roadmap for attaining sust sustainability over the next 20 years, how they are, how they look, um, what are they assessing as their overdraft, um, you know, what, what kind of problems are they assessing, um, what kind of solutions are they looking to, how does this all add up at the level of the region, given that these are, are sub-basins that are interconnected hydrologically, physically, but also this is a, a region that has a lot of shared water infrastructure and it definitely has a shared economy as well. So that's what we're gonna be presenting to you today. We're gonna to be giving you some highlights from that. And really our goal here is to help build a shared understanding of how well these plans tackle these core objectives uh, for this you know, early roadmap to sustainability and hopefully help to further a, a conversation about how everyone can work together to, to achieve success and to, to manage, manage water resources in a way that's gonna build a strong foundation for, for the future. So I want to let us get on with the program, but before doing that, I have a, a, a few sort of welcomes and thanks and logistics to share with you. First, there's another welcome to this audience. Um, 
we we are really grateful to have you with us. We wish we could see you in person, but you know, actually it's turning out that this virtual format is making it, I think, easier for folks to join. So we had about 750 people registered to, to join this event as of this morning. Um, this is folks from all around the state and, and also Washington, DC. We've got local officials and stakeholders from the Valley. We've got folks from state agencies, from federal agencies. Um, I wanna just give a, a particular shout out to Secretary Ross from the Department of Agriculture, State Department of Agri Food and Agriculture and to Director Nemeth from the Department of Water Resources. But um, you know, re really happy to have you among us and um, just really, really pleased to see you virtually, your names at least. I wish we could visit in person, but um, we're hoping that we're gonna get to a really nice interactive discussion Q&A with the audience. Um, so we want you to please you know, send in your questions to us. Um, we'll, we'll pop up a, a slide to, to give you that address. Um, there you go. So set, send us questions uh, as, as they come to you and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And please uh, give, give us your name and affiliation if you're comfortable with that, that way we can acknowledge you. Um, another thanks is to the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, which supported this research and the event, um, and really want to acknowledge the folks there, Lori Dox, the, the CEO, and Joy of Energy, the program director, and, and others. Um, their support has been really key for all of PPIC Water Policy Center's work. Um, I want to also let you know that you can find some additional resources from our review of the groundwater sustainability plans on our website. That includes a blog series that we've done over the last few months, several new data sets that we've made available to help people both locally and, and across the, the region and elsewhere um, understand better what's in the plans. Uh, and then today's slide presentation that we're going to see in a moment and also an overview of our findings that we submitted as public comment to the Department of Water Resources, which is responsible for reviewing these plans. So our program today is going to include a presentation followed by a few key takeaways and then Q&A. Um, I want to, us to get onto that, but just first also thank our virtual events team. We've got a crack team working behind the scenes to make this all look good. So. Um, Thanks very much. And they and we would really appreciate it if you could answer the post-event survey that you'll get an email about later today if you pre-registered. That will just help us to let us know how we did and, and suggestions for improvements as, as we refine this new way of, of reaching out to, to our audiences. So now, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague, Yelena Yazdemirovich, who is a key member of our water team and who's been one of the, the key folks working in the San Joaquin Valley over the last few years with folks in the Valley. Um, and I, I will say this was a team effort by a number of us at the, at the Water Center, but it's really Yelena who, who was the driving force behind this, who back in December said, we just got to do this and started digging into some of the draft, draft plans. And it's really been a labor of love and, um, I think that you'll enjoy what she has to share with you. So Yelena, please take it away. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I will be presenting our main findings from the review of groundwater sustainability plans in the San Joaquin Valley. And we've really taken the regional approach to this review. Our hope was to sort of look across the basin lines to see how the numbers all add up. Um, as, as many of you know, Valley has a pretty fragmented in institutional landscape. There's a lot of groundwater sustainability agencies, close to 100. Um, in critically overdrafted basins, there's been 36 groundwater sustainability plans. Um, so really the only way you can see where the potential fu future problems might be and, and what are the good solutions in, in different parts of the Valley is to piece it all together and look at it uh, as a whole. So really what we're sort of doing today is, uh, it's a bit of an archeological experience where uh, we're gonna dig up some fragments, we're gonna glue them together, we're gonna see how the hole looks, where are the cracks, and then we're gonna see what's the, what's the sort of the story of all of this. 
So without further ado, I'm gonna kick us off. And um, I'm gonna start with a quick recap um, of the research that PPIC has already done in the Valley. So for the past several years, we worked on a detailed analysis of the options for addressing the Valley's water scarcity and then other related issues as well. Uh, what we found is that a historical overdraft in the region averages about 1.8 million acre feet. This amounts to about 11% of net water use. Since agriculture is the main water user in the region, this sector really has that crucial responsibility in ending overdraft. So the goal of this initial analysis we conducted was to look at what are the costs of using less groundwater to the agricultural sector? And then how do these costs vary under different water management scenarios? So what I'm presenting in this figure are changes in several economic indicators. So you see crop revenues, farm-related GDP and employment, and then land following. And the color of the bars indicates a water management scenario. So what you immediately see here is that the brown bar, which is the inflexible water use, is the worst or at least costliest outcome for the Valley's economy. So this is where everyone would cut back their pumping proportional to the size of overdraft in the basin. Now, if you go down to the red bar and allow local trading of both groundwater and surface water within basins, this reduces costs by about 40%. And if you go further down to a yellow bar uh, and, and allow expanding surface water trading across basins, this reduces costs by about 60%. And finally, in the blue bar, if we add cost-effective new supplies to water trading, this brings down costs even further, which is to about less than one third where, than where we started off with inflexible water use. So you, you will notice one more thing, which is that adding new supplies also really moves the needle on land fallowing required to end overdraft, uh, which goes from roughly 750,000 acres to about 500,000 acres. I will say uh, that our analysis indicated that new supplies that farmers can afford might fill roughly half a million acre feet of the gap. We considered a wide range of sources for this new supply and found that groundwater recharge by far is the most promising option. But even with that, the new supplies can only fill about 25% of the overdraft. And you know, one thing we should really consider is that getting to this combination of supply expansion and demand management is not a done deal. There's substantial coordination that has to happen on who gets the water for recharge, how water is traded, where it's necessary to expand infrastructure. So there's just quite a bit of work ahead to make it all happen. So, we had a good sense of what getting to sustainability might look like based on our research, but we wondered how did the plans envision all of this? So the 36 plans we reviewed are a bit taller than the stack of binders on this picture. And I'm sure that this is not gonna come as a surprise to any of the consultants who are working on these uh, plans who are on call today. Um, so to, we sort of limited our review on three key areas of interest. How well the plans assess the size of overdraft? How do agencies anticipate to end overdraft? And then finally, do the plans effectively address dry drinking water wells and land subsidence, which as Ellen mentioned, are, are real problem areas in the Valley and have been long-term issues there. So we, we're gonna first look at the size of overdraft. The two maps here report the average overdraft amount by groundwater basin. As you can see on the map A, the plans report quite a bit of overdraft, uh, which adds up to around 1.4 million acre feet for the entire valley. But the, the problem here is that each basin uses a different time frame to calculate their water balance, so it's really misleading to just add up the totals for the valley. For example, uh, what we found was that the basins in southern, drier part of the valley 
which are shown, shown with orange bars here, were less likely to include the latest drought in their balances. And the combination of the wet and dry years, as you can imagine, uh, really affects what your average overdraft is gonna be. So for a better comparison, we wanted to look at the eight years that are included in all of the budgets. And those are 2003 through 2010. This is shown on the map B. This short period really works well because it includes both wet and dry years. And what we see is that the plans estimate about 1.7 million acre feet of annual overdraft in these years. And this is fairly close to our valley-wide estimate of 1.9 million acre feet for that same time period. So I think we can conclude that the plans generally tell a reasonable story that is broadly consistent with, with what the regional water balance shows in this period. Nonetheless, uh, some basins are probably underestimating overdraft and there are some sub-regional inconsistencies. And we should keep in mind that if the future is drier than the past, the overall challenge for the valley could be even greater than what plans are preparing for. I brought up earlier that the San Joaquin Valley has the largest groundwater overdraft in the state but the water scarcity varies within the region. And these variable conditions call for regional cooperation to end overdraft. And you really see this on this set of maps, this variability. So what I'm showing you here is average surface water deliveries from 2001 to 2015 to irrigated cropland in the valley. So areas that are shown in blue are in relatively decent surface water shape. And then the further up we go to yellow, red, the more those areas rely on groundwater. So those that are shown in the darkest shade of red do not receive regular deliveries of surface water, which means they practically rely only on groundwater. So when you look at these maps overall, you'll notice, okay, there's some blue in the valley, but there is a lot of red on these maps. And the higher the reliance on groundwater, the more vulnerable an area is to pumping cutbacks. So this is especially concerning for perennial crops. And those are nut and fruit orchards and vines, and we show these on the map in the middle. There's been an incredible increase in perennial crops in the valley in the past several decades. And this expansion has benefited the regional economy. It enabled valley agric agriculture to generate GDP and jobs. Um, but perennials are also less flexible. They need to be watered every year to maintain the investment. So the concerning point is that at this point, the perennials occupy nearly 60% of irrigated lands in the valley. And more than 20% of perennial acreage is on groundwater only lands, which are really vulnerable to cutbacks. So I just wanna say that it's really important in the transition to sustainability to avoid unnecessarily large reductions in high value crop acreage, which would have a disproportionate effect on regional employment and GDP. So really uh, the, the take home message here is that ideally the solutions to overdraft would look regionally at where water is needed, where it's available, and then consider how to move it around in a cost effective way to benefit everyone in the valley. So do the plans take that regional approach to solutions? Well, not quite yet. We've taken down descriptions and volume amounts for over 500 projects and management actions in the plans. We categorized projects into three bins and you can see those in this figure. So altogether, the plans present about 2.2 million acre feet per year of supply and demand solutions. And this is in principle enough to end the overdraft anticipated in the, in the plans. But the emphasis is really on supply solutions. So on this figure in blue, we are showing projects that would augment the overall supplies in the region, accounting for about 47% of total volume. There's a huge emphasis on recharge here, as you can see, it's almost a million acre feet. This is consistent with our finding that recharging flood water is, is the most promising new supply 
but it's really double the amount of water that we estimate is feasible and affordable to capture in the valley. Even if this much water was physically available for recharge, the reality is that water users will be competing for flood water that can be feasibly captured, which is likely a much smaller volume than presented in the plants. In yellow, we are showing projects that would increase water supply within an individual plan area, but they would not necessarily change the regional balance. These projects are basically moving surface water around from existing uses to new ones. So from a regional perspective, it's really important not to double count this water. And if the plans consider it as an addition to their balance, this water should be subtracted from the balance of where it's currently used. And to be honest, there's very little evidence that this is happening in the plans currently. I will say that these projects are pretty important in that our, our analysis showed that projects that shift surface water use could be really helpful to reduce the cost of signal implementation. And then finally, in red, uh, we are showing demand management projects. This includes water use cutbacks by agriculture and the urban areas. As you can see in the figure, the focus on managing demand is limited at only about 20% um, of the total volume reported. So um, if you take away one thing from this presentation today, uh, I, I hope it's this. Um, any single one of these projects might be completely reasonable uh, and perfectly sound in its yield estimates and, and could really help the area where it's planned. Um, but when you put all of these projects together and look at the entire valley, the numbers for supply expansion just don't add up. And I think that's really speaks to the danger of super localized nature of these plants. There's just a, a, a need for a big picture look at the region. So over here, I just wanted to share um, a breakdown of the supply and demand portfolios by basin. So that's what the three maps are showing. Um, and, and you will see immediately that most basins propose a mix of solutions. Um, there's some supply augmentation, some shifting of surface water use and some managing demand. Um, but nonetheless, there's really not a lot of emphasis on demand management. And it's, it's well known at this point that reducing water use in this region largely means reducing the amount of irrigated cropland. Uh, and there's been reluctance to seriously consider the demand side since this is a pretty early stage of signal implementation. Um, most plans that acknowledge the need to manage the demand do not yet consider flexible tools that could reduce economic costs like groundwater trading and uh, monetary incentives for land following, etc. So there is quite a bit uh, of, of work to be done uh, in, in the plans, at least on the demand management side. So I want to shift gears just slightly to say that we've talked quite a bit today about ending overdraft, but Sigma was not implemented to end overdraft for its own sake, but in order to prevent the six undesirable results from happening, and those are shown here. They're also affectionately known as the six deadly sins of Sigma, and they include lowering of groundwater levels, reduction of storage, land subsidence, seawater intrusion, surface water depletion, and then degraded water quality. So under SIGMA, plans are required to define indicators and then set thresholds to avoid significant and unreasonable impacts in each of these areas. We've reviewed um, how plans address two of the undesirable results, lowering of the water levels and then land subsidence. And we really focused on these two areas because they've posed long-term challenges in the valley and had some pretty bad impacts on, on water users and, and everybody who lives there. 
Um, so I'll, I'll kick it off with water levels, which uh, have been declining for a very long time in the valley. And the situation has gotten especially bad during the last drought. This is a challenge for shallow wells that households and small communities rely on. As you can see on the map A, the red dots represent roughly 2,300 domestic wells that went dry in the valley, with about two thirds of those are located in Kings Basin, which simply has a lot of domestic wells. Um, they have a high share of those in the valley. So under Sigma, local agencies need to set minimum water level thresholds to avoid effects that are considered significant and unreasonable. So what this means for domestic well users is um, the agencies can either set the thresholds that are protective of domestic wells or provide mitigation of negative impacts if those thresholds are not protected. And this mitigation includes physical solutions like uh, paying, paying for drilling deeper wells or providing alternative sources of supplies to affected water users. There are many solutions here. So the map B provides a summary of how the plans treat domestic wells. So in dark blue, we have plans which set thresholds to protect domestic wells from going dry. In this lighter blue are plans which acknowledge, okay, we have thresholds that might cause some wells to go dry, but uh, we have a mitigation program in place already. And in yellow, we have plans which are also saying, yes, our thresholds might cause wells to go dry, and we are considering a mitigation program in the future, uh, but there is no firm plan in place at the moment. And finally, in red are plans which either do not discuss the potential impacts their thresholds have on the domestic wells, or don't consider these impacts to merit action. So this includes the King's Basin, where three of the seven plans acknowledge that about 600 domestic wells may go dry, but they don't consider this a significant and unreasonable impact of continued overdraft. I just want to say here that many shallow wells uh, serve disadvantaged communities, and, and this really makes the stakes here pretty high. Um, I will remind everyone that San Joaquin Valley also has a high share of water systems that experience water quality issues as well. There's a real need to think about what are the best ways to address the safe drinking water challenges together. Um, and many plans are really lacking in this regard. So this is a, is a real area of improvement. And finally, um, subsidence has also been a significant long-term challenge in the Valley. The land sinking caused by groundwater overdraft can harm infrastructure like water conveyance, um, then also roads and bridges, flood control structures. Um, and, and it's important to realize, and we don't often talk about this, that not only local areas where the problem is occurring are affected. Um, subsidence negatively impacts everyone who relies on the infrastructure and they may, they may be far away and out of the basin. Um, I will say with subsidence that the problems have also gotten worse during the last drought um, when the capacity on the big water conveyance through the valley was affected, especially on Franklin Canal and California Aqueduct. So what I'm showing on these maps is uh, on map A, we have recent subsidence trends from the end of drought to 2019. You will notice that subsidence doesn't really affect all areas of the valley equally. And already you can notice subsidence hotspots where issues have been pronounced. And then the map B shows maximum total subsidence that is allowed in plants by 2040. And the dots that are shown there are monitoring sites where plants uh, intend to measure subsidence. So by now, I, I hope you know that red generally means not so great, blue is a little bit better, and dark red indicates uh, on this map indicates that many plans are giving themselves quite a bit of leeway over the next 20 years. Uh, and, and some accept 10 to 15 feet of additional subsidence, which is 
kind of a staggering number, really. Um, but don't let the map fool you, um, because even the lower thresholds in some sensitive areas uh, might mean big infrastructure impacts. So, for instance, a foot drop along Fry and Kirk Canal or a two foot drop along California Aqueduct might mean a 10% decrease in canal capacity. So, um, so there's a just because the threshold is lower doesn't necessarily mean that the situation is better in those areas. So in our review of these plans, we found that some of them are doing a good job of tying infrastructure impacts to thresholds for land subsidence. And this is especially the case in Chowchilla and parts of Delta Mendota basins, um, where they sort of say that they intend to monitor water levels and not let them drop beyond a certain level that would cause subsidence. Um, but others really need to do more work in setting thresholds that just make sense for infrastructure impacts. So there's quite a bit of work uh, to be done here. Okay, I will stop here. Uh, and I wanna remind everyone to send us questions by emailing ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Um, so in a, in a very brief conclusion, I wanna say that putting together these GSPs has been a major local effort and a, and a big milestone of this law. Um, but there is a lot of work to be done. Um, but you know, Sigma has a very long timeline and, and it's important that we get going. Um, so with that, I want to pass it off to Ellen. Um, Ellen, when you look at this batch of plans, uh, what are your thoughts? So thank you for that presentation, Yelena, and um, for, the, for all of the, the really hard work that went into this analysis, which we're, we're hoping, as I, as I said when we started out, is, is going to be it's meant in the spirit of helping folks figure out what are the what are the important next steps, um, acknowledging that a heck of a lot of work went into getting getting us to this milestone. Um, you know, a lot of Sigma since Sigma was enacted, we had uh, folks having to create new institutions to manage groundwater, sometimes out of whole cloth, gathering a tremendous amount of information, and really we should think of these plans as kind of the beginning of a, of a, of a chart to manage this essential resource in a, in a fundamentally new way. Uh, as Yelma said, these are still early days in Sigma implementation. And in fact, um, in five years, these agencies will need to resubmit uh, plan updates um, in addition to tracking progress and submitting certain kinds of information to the state every year. So um, this first five year period of Sigma implementation, we can really think of as uh, a time for getting a better understanding of how well the plans are gonna set them up to, to get to success. And um, I think you know, what it's important to remember in this context is that they are gonna need to, they don't need to solve everything overnight, but they will need to show progress along the way. And they're gonna have to address significant negative impacts. Um, the, the law doesn't give you leeway to just wait until 2040 for that. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that these are extraordinary times and you know, just like we're meeting virtually, folks are now in the process of implementing Sigma virtually with um, tremendous amount of meetings that are still going on. And you know, this is water is an essential area as is agriculture. So, you know, a lot of folks are are also um, you know, working, trying to work safely in the, in the field to, to, make, uh, to make all of this come together. Um, the pandemic is not only changing how we work, it's also, uh, you know, as we saw from the, the budget announcements uh, last week, is, is a, going to be affecting budgetary resources available for support from the state. And the state did uh, indicate, the administration indicated it's likely gonna be cutting back some of the support that it was that, that the administration was anticipating back in January for Sigma implementation. I think our message on this is that 
it's important not to lose sight of the importance of Sigma for California's future. So to the extent that some resources can continue to go into technical support and helping to accompany uh, locals as they implement Sigma, this is gonna be really important for California's future. So those of you who know us know that we like to make recommendations based on our work. And we've got a lot of recommendations for DWR in the public comments that we submitted. And in past work and in the blog series, we've also highlighted some of our um, more detailed recommendations for folks at, at the local level as well. What I just want to leave you with um, as a sort of start for our conversation is three things that we think are going to be essential to ensure success. And they really Im involve both, both locals and the state and, and to some extent federal agencies. And so the first message is, and you heard this from Yelena's presentation, um, it's going to be important to look beyond local plan boundaries. You know, Sigma was set up to, to foster local involvement and local control, and that's appropriate and, and necessary, but there's also a piece of it that's missing here, which is that the plans are just too local to successfully enable management of the transition to groundwater sustainability in ways that are protective of the regional economy, of society and of the environment. And what this means is not that locals shouldn't worry about their local conditions, indeed they have to, but they also need to collaborate more both within basins and across basins. And this is things like planning for recharge, addressing infrastructure needs that are gonna be necessary for any of these, almost any of these local recharge projects that folks are, are planning to work. They're gonna to have to think about more regional infrastructure. Sharing water is gonna be important as you saw and more. Um, the state is really gonna to have to play a key role in this too. And what we concluded after looking at this is that DWR, in addition to reviewing the individual plans to see if they are complying with the law, really needs some kind of formal mechanism to see how plans within a region fit together in places where these basins are connected, the water systems are connected and the economy is connected. So this is gonna be important in the San Joaquin Valley. I will just anticipate that in two years, we're gonna be seeing plans coming in from the Sacramento Valley and it's gonna be essential there as well. The state can also incentivize this kind of collaboration with grants and technical support. Now, second uh, of, of my three main points, you know, first is go beyond local. Second, do a better job addressing undesirable results. This is something that really has to happen now. A lot of the plans, as you saw from Yelena's slides, have major gaps, and these could accelerate when the next drought hits, and we may already be in that next drought based on the, the numbers of our, our precipitation this year. So what needs to happen? The state really now should be requiring more extensive analyses of undesirable results and more proactive responses um, and should continue, and this is gonna be key in the budget environment that we're in, continue supporting improved data collection for decision-making on things like um, domestic wells, land subsidence. Locals for their part should be not only doing this analysis, but really look creatively at pursuing mitigation strategies rather than just thinking, oh, you know, the costs of low of, of stopping pumping are going to be so high that we just can't do it. Um, very interesting analysis from Chowchilla and Madera basins, which are considering mitigation for domestic wells that would go dry with their groundwater levels that they're allowing with their thresholds. What they find is that it could be many fold less costly to provide alternative solutions like deeper wells for these communities. So thinking about that is gonna be an important part of addressing undesirable results. Now, my, th my third takeaway is the importance of piloting promising new approaches. Um, a lot of the successful strategies that are gonna be important for Sigma implementation are gonna require folks to get out of their comfort zones and do things in new ways and piloting and taking some baby steps on that um, to sort of test the waters and find out what works um, and then be able to model that for others can be really, really valuable. For locals, this is gonna be especially important in efforts to manage demand where we've seen that there's just not a lot of action there yet. So things like groundwater trading and stewarding fallowed lands, really important there. We're starting to see some small steps forward in this and <coughs> excuse me, and, 
And I think really we need to see more of that. Um, the state and the federal agencies can support local efforts. It's really valuable and not too costly to support pilot efforts. This helps, helps take that, those risky steps for locals. And then the state should also for its part consider piloting a new approach to allocating floodwaters for recharge. Um, as you saw, there's a lot more demand for that water than there is supply of that water. And our current system, there's been some progress made at the state board level to, to speed allocation of these waters, but our current system kind of relies still on our uh, first in time, first in right um, water rights system. And it's, it's basically whoever gets in line first and su submits a successful proposal is the one who gets it. What we're suggesting is a better way might be an auction mechanism. And this is something that could both reduce conflict ensure that that water gets into the ground faster and that it goes to the most beneficial uses. So part of our blog series addresses that point. Um, so with that, I am gonna now invite Yelena back and say there's still time to submit questions. I see some are already starting to come in. Um, so we're gonna move to that part of the program now and look forward to virtually chatting with you all. And so, I see a first question from, from Jeff Vanden Heuvel of the Milk Producers Council. Jeff says, since Sigma gives 20 years uh, to the GSAs to achieve the sustainability goal, it should be no surprise that incentives for demand managed would not be fully developed in the first version of the GSPs. Um, for sure. Um, this is not a, I would say, Jeff, this is not a, a criticism of the plans in the sense that they um, we acknowledge that that it, it, it this is not the first place people want to go. But what we also would like to highlight is that it's not going to be it, it's not like you just push a button and successfully manage demand either. And and so it's going to be important. This is where the idea of piloting and you know starting to kind of get things ready to be able to manage demand in a smart way is important. And you know, part of that has to do with exploring with folks, getting folks comfortable with the idea of, of groundwater trading, which is something that's gonna be completely new in this valley. Um, and there are some promising pilots um, that, are, that folks are, are starting um, down in Kern County in the Rosedale Rio Bravo area in a partnership with some NGOs. And also now, um, both in Madeira and in King, some of the GSAs are working, and this is with a U.S. Bureau of Reclamation grant on starting to explore groundwater trading. I think those everybody should have their eyes on that to, to look for look look for what they learn and and how to grow that. So our second question is: Your results would seem to point toward the lack of more regional regional co coordination as an important problem. What's your perspective and have you considered or suggested possible adjustments to the Sigma process as a result? Yelena, I'm gonna toss that to you. Yeah, and these are uh, questions by Dave Worth. Hi, Dave. Um, so um, it's, it's really clear that um, regional coordination is an important problem. Um, I think that I will kind of take it back to what, what Ellen was talking about earlier, which is um, what we have a chance, or at least the DWR has a chance now um, to create a formal mechanism to review these plans in a more regional manner. Um, and I, I don't think that requires necessarily a, a change in the Sigma process and the law itself, uh, but there should be an opportunity that we, um, that we add up these numbers and, and see how it all hangs. Um, so I, I think that uh, this, this will be important um, for, for the review process for the most part. And Dave has also asked us whether we've created a list of GSPs which are not addressing water levels and subsidence. Um, so we, uh, I, I'm just gonna take this moment to plug all of our data sets that uh, have gone into creation of the figures in this PowerPoint. All of them are available on our website and in the blogs we've created uh, uh, on the review of these groundwater sustainability plans. Um, we do have a list of 
uh, GSPs and how they address these various undesirable results. Uh, and some of that data is already presented in the figures in the blog, but, um, but yes, that's sort of a short answer. Thank you. So this is now a question from Lois Henry. Hi, Lois. Can you address how budget cuts will affect Sigma review and accountability? That is a very good question. I think you know, we're in early days of understanding um, what the implications are gonna be for water agencies uh, sort of on the, on the economic side, on the revenue side. And um, you know, it's quite possible that there will be some agencies that are gonna have, have challenges in meeting their, their normal operational expenses and, and certainly their, their capital expenses. Um, I am hoping that the state is not gonna be cutting its own um, review process and, and ability to, to kind of you know, keep the momentum going on Sigma. And I'm also really hoping that at the local level, folks are gonna find the ways to do this uh, efficiently and effectively and, and not drop the ball. So now um, I do, I, I, uh, our screen is telling us that there are a lot of questions being asked. So we're going to try to get, we're going to try to be efficient in answering as many as we can. If we don't get to get to your question, uh, we'll try to, to follow up with you afterwards. Um, so here's the next one. What information can GSAs use to better predict potential of, of alternative supplies that can be provided from recharge? And why are there significant differences between PPIC and GSP estimates? Yelena, I want to ask you to take yeah. a first step um, at that. So the real problem here is that um, it's, it's that uh, regional outlook that we, we have been talking about. Um, so, so PPIC has estimated the water available for recharge uh, that can be uh, uh, really captured in a cost-effective manner. Um, the, the problem is when every plant creates their own small localized projects, uh, they don't consider that the water they're counting on might be used by somebody else. So I think that the situation we have is that a lot of these plans are creating projects where um, everybody's counting on the same water basically. And, uh, and it's a lot of water. And to move that water, we need a uh, much bigger conveyance uh, to store it very quickly because this water is, is flood water that comes in short time spans. Uh, so we, we really have to improve our systems for capturing it uh, in the first place. Um, and even if we could capture it all, it's, it's, it's probably not feasible to make all of that investment in this infrastructure. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the main reason I would say. So here, oh, hi, Larry McKenney. Um, how are you? Uh, there's a question from Larry. Does the same logic apply more generally to overdraft and demand management? And the idea that demand management might reduce use or um, simply planning with open eyes for the economic impacts of shortages in the least destructive way. So, yeah, I think, I think that the issue with demand management, the demand management is scary um, for, for folks because you know when it when it comes to managing demand in, in agriculture, you know, you can you can you really need to be reducing your net water use. And so it's the irrigation efficiency investments are great for all kinds of things in the valley, but it is not a free pass to just um, keep the same amount of acreage in production by by switching to more efficient irrigation technology. And in fact, in a lot of places, people have already made that switch. So there's not a whole lot of additional to sort of water to be gotten out of that anyway. But the, the, the key is that the crops are, uh, it's, it's the water that the crops are using that you have to, to reduce. And so um, you're mainly talking about taking, taking acreage out of production. And the, then comes the sort of next question, next sort of thought in that, which is, okay, how do you do that in a way that is least uh, impactful to the economy? And that is where flexible, the idea of flexible 
water use comes in and the idea of trading. And the, the, I will say that there's already a very active surface water market in the valley. This is a, a region, you know, agriculture is a business and water is an input and folks have figured out how to use the infrastructure in pretty creative ways to be able to, to move some of that water around. Um, there's going to be more demand for moving surface water around uh, now with Sigma. And the new frontier is also thinking about when you have to go on a groundwater diet, how, how you do that in, in a way that's also flexible. So in introducing the idea of groundwater trading, which is used very effectively in some adjudicated basins in, in Southern California, in, <coughs> excuse me, in the Mojave Basin, for example. But those are sort of steps that require folks to go beyond the, all right, we've got a problem and we've got to reduce our water use to how are we going to organize ourselves in ways that are going to make the people who would trade the water whole we're going to address any community concerns that there might be about shifting where that water is going to be used and thinking kind of more collectively about are there more strategic decisions for how we want to think about which land is going to come out of production. And this is going to actually be really important for figuring out ways to get more value out of the land that comes out of production too. A lot of folks that we've talked to, you know, I think in, in general in the Valley, folks would like to see as little land following as possible, but everybody we've talked to uh, would like to not see that happen in a completely haphazard way that is just gonna lead to, you know, in, increased dust problems, pests and weeds for neighboring farms and so on, but rather in ways that, that can provide alternative value to the land. And that's where sort of scaling up your thinking about this to, you know, county, and beyond really thinking regionally is going to be really important. So next question, your results would seem to point, oh, this is from Graham Fogg at UC Davis. Hi, Graham. Your results would seem to point toward the lack of more regional coordination is an important problem. What's your perspective and how do you consider suggested possible adjustments to the Sigma process? So, you know, I think Yellen addressed this a little bit earlier from Dave, Dave Orth, so I had a similar question, which is, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're suggesting that in addition to folks in the valley needing to kind of, kind of find some way to coordinate and, and look across their plans, that the state could really play a, a key role in, in this process. And, you know, I think in some ways, the analysis that we've shown for you is kind of the baby steps in what that would look like. Um, but, you know, we haven't we haven't dug dug deep into the in, into the identified water supply sources and so on, and that's something that folks at DWR could be really helpful with. Yeah, Madeline, the, oh, go ahead, Yelena. Sorry. The hope is also that you know these are a lot of this is growing pains for ground sustainability agencies, and maybe over time they will also realize that there's economies of scale in some consolidation within basins, and so. Um, I feel, I, I hope that that's where the future takes us. Me too. So here's a question from Madeline Glickfeld down at um, the Institute for the Environment at UCLA, um, who's been doing some work on issues of, of safe drinking water. And her question is related to that. So in the absence of reduced uh, pumping, do you think there's enough replenishment plan to improve water levels and where, and she's, wondering particularly in the Kings Basin, who should pay for emergency water if the groundwater levels drop too far for disadvantaged community wells. Um, Yell, do you wanna yeah. take um, a first crack at that? Yeah, so um, th there is sort of two ways this program can be funded. Um, and certainly pumpers who are pumping groundwater in those basins should be responsible for part of the fees uh, for this mitigation program. Uh, one thing I will say is that in Madeira, uh, they've also applied for a, for a grant from the Department of Water Resources to help offset some of the costs of their mitigation program. Um, and, and then I, I just wanna say that, and this is something I brought up in the presentation as well, San Joaquin Valley is a real hotspot of safe drinking water issues in the state on both water quantity and water quality side. And there's been a big investment that the state is making to resolve some of the water quality issues and to help water systems there uh, provide safe drinking water. And 
we are basically hoping that, that, that this vision can sort of merge on the both water quality and the water quantity side and that um, the funding can come partly from the state, but definitely partly from the locals who are continuing to pump, uh, you know, for, for the benefit of the regional economy. And I think, you know, in, in, in thinking about that too, that there's um, part of the coordination challenge is this challenge at the, at the very local level too. And it kind of gets back to, to Lois's question about funding. Um, one of the challenges for the GSA is they have, they have fee raising authority. Sigma gave them that, but it's hard to raise money for stuff when you're when it comes to introducing new fees um, and there's a proposition 218 requirement in California for any kind of local fee like that that you know means that people can't just go and the agencies can't just go and impose a fee without without a, a certain amount of buy-in from the folks who are going to be paying it um, there are definitely some opportunities that are going to require some funding and um, it's going to it's going to require locals to to put put in some of that money um, and I think thinking creatively about that it, it may be um, in, in some cases like with safe drinking water finding ways to pool funding so water users contributing some of it but then finding ways to kind of bring bring in other funds from from state and, and federal programs that can basically get us to a better place with the water supplies for these communities than, than we are now. Um, and, and, and going beyond just thinking about mitigation for water levels falling to, to get, getting, getting to a place that's where, where, where we are not only sustainably managing groundwater, but we're also providing, ensuring safe drinking water for, for communities. Yeah, and in this case, some Existing programs could be really instructive and, and you know, there are water banks in Kern with, with mitigation programs already in place and they've been doing this for a very long time. So um, information sharing in this case could be really helpful to other areas considering this. So now there's a question about the, what role does the state have in overseeing the interconnectivity of these plans for state water management success? That's kind of building this from Ursula's stock, and that's kind of building on the same idea of the kind of we, that we've been uh, highlighting that we think the, we we think DWR needs to play play this role of of helping to to kind of help folks t take the regional perspective. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'll just maybe give a give a mention here also to. The, the idea of creating a, a, a regional body to do this too. Um, and um, there's been, there've been some baby steps on this. Uh, I, I'll, I'll call them uh, in, the, in the San Joaquin Valley, which is called the San Joaquin Valley Blueprint, which is something that has been spearheaded by some of the, the large regional water um, agencies, the Friant Water Authority and the, the Delta Mendota Water Authority and a lot of agricultural folks are at the table. Um, something like that potentially, if, if it kind of moves toward starting to really look at the range of regional solutions and getting a lot of buy-in from communities beyond agriculture could, could be a really important way for, for the Valley to, to take this regional approach as well. And I see that we have like a half a second left here. Um, so it says there are so many more questions. We're really sorry, we can't answer them all <laughs> for you, but we wanna thank you so much uh, for, for being here with us and uh, remind you that the slides and our review are available online on the event page. We're gonna be posting this video to the PPIC website within a few days so you can you know, watch it again or share it with, with folks. Um, remember that you're gonna get a survey later today if you registered online. And please, please help us get better by taking a minute to let us know how we did. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone, bye.